Hello, everybody. This is a planetarium show, and it's set for the 1st of May 2020. So it will show you the sky as it would be for that date, and for the most of uh, part, it'll be pretty much the same for the whole of May, with one or two things moving around, and of course the moon being the main one. But uh, it will show you the main constellations and the positions of the planets for the month of May. So let's begin. So what I'm going to do is uh, slew over and we'll watch the uh, sun go down. It's uh, late afternoon, early evening at the moment. And we can run time forwards so that the sun accelerates down towards the horizon, speed things up a little bit. And as, of course, the sun sets, you get that lovely orange colour in the sky created as the light from the sun is being bent through the Earth's atmosphere. There it goes, down below the trees and uh, down below the horizon, we get that uh, sunset colour and of course the sky begins to darken. Now what we find straight away in the evening sky in May is the planet Venus here. Very, very bright. It's the first thing that will become visible and you just can't miss it. But with this planetarium software, we can zoom right in. This is the sort of view that you get with a powerful telescope. The one that I'm using at my observatory shows it up very nicely. Now, Venus is looking as about as large as it ever looks at the moment because it's really quite close to the Earth. It's just swinging by us on the inside, it will overtake us shortly. And that's why we're seeing that crescent shape of the light side where the light is coming from the side towards the sun. So we'll zoom back away from Venus. We really don't get to see very much detail on the planet because all we're looking at is the light reflected back to us from the very thick cloud tops. Venus has an atmosphere that's about a hundred times as dense as our own. And unless you happen to uh, have a space probe and drop it down through the clouds, you really don't see anything, even with the most powerful telescopes. So there it is glowing brightly in the sky. We'll uh, let time run forward now and get ourselves to the point where we've got some properly dark skies. Now, of course, in May, the uh, sky is beginning to remain light for a very long time. The winter is often the better time for doing astronomy, but we'll go right through till 11 p.m. And uh, at that point, Venus will just about be uh, on the verge down here, disappearing towards the horizon. We'll just bring that to a halt there. And the next object we're going to go and look at is the moon. And the moon is showing a lovely half phase at the moment. That's perfect because you can see all of the detail in the partially shaded craters all along the day night boundary. It's called the Terminator. And you can also see the big mare the dark round areas on the moon there those are ancient impact basins where huge space rocks hit the moon and punctured the crust well worth having a look at pull back away from the moon it's sitting uh, in a constellation of leo just next door is the constellation cancer and uh, on the right hand side we've got the two stars of gemini there but there's the stick drawing of cancer the crab and a bit of Leo the lion up there to the uh, side where the moon is. So we can show you the artwork for those, Cancer and Leo. And as I say, the bright stars to the right of Cancer are Castor and Pollux, the heavenly twins of Gemini. Now what we're going to do is just zoom in on perhaps their favourite object right in the centre of Cancer the Crab, and that's called the Beehive Cluster. Very nice object to look at with binoculars. There's a hundreds of stars all gathered together and they, they were born together out of one cloud of gas and dust so they're all about the same age and they're gradually going to disperse over time as uh, they have near misses with each other and gravitational slingshots throw stars out willy-nilly all over the galaxy to go and do their own thing that's what happens to these clusters they gradually sort of boil away the stars escape from them. So that's the beehive cluster. Now we're going to swing over and have a bit more of a look at Leo the lion and this is one of the constellations where 
I can kind of see how they make a lion out of the stick diagram. It's sort of obvious where the head and the body and the tail are. Not all of the constellations are like that. There again is Leo and next door we've got Cancer that we looked at just now. So we'll take the artwork away and we'll look at one or two of the objects in Leo. And Leo's famous for containing some very nice galaxies and some groups of galaxies. So here is a trio of galaxies just there. And they go by the Messier catalogue numbers 95, 96 and 105, these three. These are numbers of items that were catalogued by Charles Messier, uh, a French astronomer. He was very interested in comets. Here's another galaxy. This one's a very nice barred spiral galaxy, one of my favourites. It's one that Charles Messier missed. I call it the Catherine Wheel Galaxy. Um, its designation is NGC 2903. But uh, very nice prominent spiral arms and really quite bright. I don't understand quite how Messier didn't manage to include that in his catalogue. And that was just off the face of Leo the Lion there, quite close to the moon on the first, so perhaps a different night would be better for observing it. Next constellation around after Leo is Virgo. And here we have the stick diagram. And OK, I can see a couple of legs and a couple of arms and a body. So I guess that this makes out the shape of a person. But here she is, the lovely Virgo. And uh, she's laid out there across the sky. Let's take her away. And Virgo is very definitely the realm of the galaxies. There's a huge supercluster of galaxies that we are heading towards, literally in space, as well as zooming in on them here with the Stellarium software. The big elliptical galaxy in the middle there, M87, is the one in which the uh, scientists were able to photograph the black hole at the center. So here's the high resolution space image of this group of galaxies about 50 million light years away. And there are dozens and dozens of them all captured by gravity. And the Milky Way is heading towards it. So we pull back away from uh, the Virgo cluster of galaxies there. There are almost so many that when you go surfing around with a telescope in that region, you really can't miss them. And we'll move on now. Just a little bit further into the night, move through to midnight. So the sky is rotating. One or two satellites whizzing across as we let time run fast. That's the moon over to the right hand side. And the other bright object there is the star Arcturus in the constellation of Butes the Herdsman. So now, we're going to go and look at uh, one of the constellations that is most famous of all, and that's Ursa Major, the Great Bear, which contains the grouping of stars that uh, you'd recognize as the Plough or the Saucepan or the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper is actually got its tail just off the top of the screen at the moment. But there's the body of the Great Bear. It's one of the biggest constellations on the sky, it covers a huge area. So we'll take him away and we'll go and have a look at a, a star in the tail of the Great Bear here on the saucepan handle. It's the middle one of the three that make up the tail. And even with the naked eye, you can see that it's a double star. And we call the two components Mizar and Alcor. But with a powerful telescope or with this software, we can zoom right in. We zoom in on Mizar here and eventually you realize that what you're looking at is two stars and you can just about make that out there. It turns out that uh, Mizar is a double and so is Alcor, so there's at least four stars in this system, all doing a complicated dance around each other under the influence of gravity. But now we're just gonna go slightly to the right of the tail of the bear. This is fuzzy patch, and as we zoom in on that, what we find is the pinwheel galaxy. This is a classic spiral galaxy with those spiral arms wound fairly tightly around the little nucleus in the middle there. There's the high resolution image of it. We can pull that in and show it in much more detail. You always get that slight yellow color to the center of the galaxy and the bluer color 
out in the spiral arms. And that's because new stars are being born in the spiral arms. And where new stars are born, you find a very energetic hot blue stars. But they don't last long. So once the star formation process ceases, then all the blue stars quickly burn out. They're burning so hot. Here's another galaxy. In fact, this is the Whirlpool galaxy and its little neighboring dwarf galaxy has come too close to it there at the top and a bridge of material has formed between them and the large Whirlpool galaxy is eating its smaller neighbor. That's how galaxies grow. Large galaxies eat small ones. It's a cannibalistic process and they eventually merge together, pull in all the material and then the galaxies get larger and larger. Different kind of object here. This is the Owl Nebula. This is the death of a sun-like star. The little white dot in the center there is the remains of the star, the white dwarf, the core of the star has been left behind and the outer layers have been puffed off into that greenish colored smoke ring. We'll see another example of that later on in tonight's tour. Just next to it, there's a galaxy that's uh, another spiral galaxy rather edge on to us, so you can't see the spiral arms very well. You can just about make it out. And this one is even further away, 45 million light years. So this is really getting quite distant. So the light has been traveling for 45 million years before it got to Earth and was captured to make the images here. We'll pull back away from that. And look at another pair of galaxies also in Ursa Major, the Great Bear, and uh, they're down towards the right. I can just see them already. As we zoom in, they'll get bigger and clearer. On the left, we have the lovely spiral galaxy Bode's Galaxy, uh, Charles Messier's object number 81. And just next to it, to the right there, is M82, the Cigar Galaxy. Now we're going to zoom in on the Cigar Galaxy because something really rather weird is going on in the middle here. It's been disrupted. There's a lot of red material shooting out from the center. And that's because this rather small galaxy had a near miss with its large neighbor about six million years ago. And it triggered off a whole burst of activity. And it's even twisted the Cigar Galaxy a little bit in the center there. The gravity of its large neighbor doing all that damage. So we'll pull back and we'll go and look now just here at the little bear, Ursa Minor. Looks a bit like a miniature version of its larger brother, even like a miniature version of the plough. You've got that rectangular grouping with the big long tail. Now, if you know anything about bears, you should perhaps realize that bears don't have big long tails. Uh, but uh, that's what the Greeks decided these objects were. So that's what we stick with. The tip of the bear's tail is a very important star though, and that's the pole star, Polaris, or North Star. You can always find this, and if you locate it in the sky, it'll be in the direction that's north of you. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you can't see it at all. If you're at the North Pole, it's directly above your head, and uh, the angle changes as you move further south. It was also a very interesting star because it's uh, a very special type that helps us measure the distance to uh, other stars. But as the sky rotates around, we're running time forwards now and letting the night evolve onwards, you see that Polaris, because it's lined up with the Earth's spin axis, stays still, whereas all the other stars seem to move around it. Now we go and run time backwards so that things zip back across the screen and we'll put it back to midnight before we move on. So as you can see Polaris right aligned with the pole there stays perfectly stationary. We'll just get that back to where we started, keep things tidy. There we are and we'll move on. I was saying that Polaris is a star that allows us to measure the distance. That's because it's a special kind of star called a Cepheid variable that pulsates according to uh, how massive it is. So if we measure the pulsation periods, 
then we can work out how bright it ought to be and from a bright, how bright it appears we can see how far away it is. Here's the constellation of Hercules the hero again a body and some sticky legs and sticky out arms just about makes sense. Here's of course upside down in this diagram most objects in astronomy tend to end up being upside down for one reason or another but here, here is Hercules the hero. And one of my favorite objects to go hunting for with a medium sized telescope, even visible with binoculars though, is the great globular cluster just here along one edge of Hercules' body. This is a group of about half a million stars all packed together into a tight ball. And Here's the high resolution image of it. It looks like uh, jewels on a velvet background when you look at it through a telescope. Uh, one of the first objects I ever looked at through a powerful scope. But there are several of these in Hercules. Here's another one. And they're about 25, 26,000 light years away. So just outside of our own Milky Way galaxy. And it's possible that they're the cause of small galaxies that the Milky Way has devoured. It's pulled all of the more loosely attached material away and just left these tightly packed cores behind. And we think there might be a small black hole in the center of each of these uh, globular clusters. There are about 400 of them scattered around the outside of the Milky Way. And other galaxies have them as well. We've detected them elsewhere. Now we're going to move next door to the constellation of Lyra, the lyre, which is a Greek musical instrument. So it looks like a parallelogram of faint stars with one bright one at the corner there. There's the uh, musical instrument it's supposed to represent. I can't quite make that out myself. And Hercules up to the top right. Now the bright star here is uh, Vega and it's a hot white star, 9,000 degrees, so our sun is only 5,800 degrees and uh, this one is perhaps uh, 25 light years away from us, putting out about 40 times the energy, which is why it appears to be one of the brighter stars in the sky. It is quite powerful, but by no means a monster. Uh, but it is relatively close as well. 25 light years is not that far across the galaxy uh, as one of the sun's nearer neighbors. It featured in the uh, movie Contact. Now here's the uh, ring nebula. This is the classic example of a star like the sun that has died, puffed off its outer layers into a smoke ring and left behind the dead white dwarf star, the nuclear reactor core at the center there. You can see it right in the middle of the ring. Very nice object to go and find. You do need a medium sized telescope for that one. It's quite a small object. needs quite a reasonable amount of magnification. So that's uh, the ring nebula and the constellation of Lyra. So we'll just pull back. Now running across the bottom of the screen here, we've got the path of the Milky Way. Those are millions of stars of the spiral arm of our galaxy. And uh, running down the length of it is the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. There goes the International Space Station across the screen. One or two other satellites and accelerating time to move us on to 4.15 a.m. Because apart from Venus, which we saw at the beginning, I haven't shown you any planets yet, and that's because three of them are hiding in the pre-dawn sky, all grouped together. So we go and have a look at those. So we'll accelerate time forwards, loads of satellites flying around. This uh, Stellarium software knows about a lot of them. And just down here now, we've arrived at 4.15 a.m. and this is the constellation of Sagittarius the Archer. But again, I'm afraid I can see a teapot, not a, a man on a horse firing a uh, bow and arrow. There's the artwork that's supposed to go with that one. And Sagittarius is a constellation that has a big thick piece of the uh, Milky Way running through it. We're looking almost towards the middle of our Milky Way galaxy when we're looking in this direction. And there are loads of star clouds and a lot of these gaseous nebulae. This is the Eagle Nebula 
And right in the center there, you can see the uh, iconic outline of the pillars of creation made famous by the photograph taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of the star forming regions of cold gas. Here's the Swan Nebula. It's another of these star forming regions where clouds of gas are collapsing together under their own gravity and new stars and new star clusters will be formed. So there's the Swan Nebula, the Swan that is there but it's upside down, it's quite hard to see. Here's the Lagoon Nebula and again you can see the star forming process has taken hold here. There's the remains of the cloud of gas but a whole new star cluster is beginning to burst into life right in the middle of the Lagoon Nebula there. That red colour is characteristic of hydrogen gas, the most common element. But here's the Trifid Nebula, where in addition to the red, we've also got a lot of blue light, because here there's some very powerful blue stars being formed, and the light from them is bouncing back off the gas, giving us either the blue or the purple tinge to the uh, reflections from the star clouds. And one or two dark dust lanes running across it as well. So we'll pull back away from the star clouds of Sagittarius there and swing a bit over to the left hand side which is where we're going to find all of those uh, planets all nicely lined up for us in the sky. So we'll go and have a look at those. And the first one that we're going to go for is Jupiter, the largest of the planets. It's larger than all the other planets put together. This is what it would look like with a small telescope. When you first see it, you'd see the four moons and the disk of the planet with a couple of dark cloud belts across it. But if you have a more powerful telescope, then you can zoom in more and get to see more detail. So let's do that now and see what we can find. Here we go, we're zooming in. Lots more detail in the cloud belts. You can see the two main equatorial belts and you can just see the red spot beginning to peep for around from the uh, left there. This planetarium software knows the position of the red spot according to the time and so it correctly shows you what you would see. Now we're going to pull back and then we're going to have a little look at each of the moons. First one here, Io, is the nearest of the large four orbiting the planet Jupiter in just 1.6 of our Earth days. It looks like a pizza. It's actually covered not in cheese but in sulphur. The four different colours of sulphur, black, red, yellow and white, all mixed together on the surface. And every one of those black dots is an active volcano on the surface of this little moon, about the same size as our own Earth's moon. Next door, the second moon of Jupiter working our way out is Europa. And this is an ice covered moon with grooves and cracks that seem to be oozing some sort of dirty brown organic material up from beneath. And we think that underneath that ice is an uh, ocean, a uh, salt, warm salty ocean in which there might be living creatures and that might be accounting for that brown organic material. Largest moon in the solar system, this third one out, is Ganymede. Ganymede is uh, the same size or larger than the planet Mercury. So if it orbited the sun, we would call it a planet, but it orbits Jupiter, so we call it a moon. Covered in ice flows and a few craters, so it's a mixed terrain. And again, could ha well have underneath that ice a warm, salty ocean, according to our measurements. Now we move over to the outer moon, Callisto, of the big four, and we find a much different surface. This one is covered in craters and no real sign of anything having changed apart from more and more craters having la landed on it where space rocks have uh, crashed into it, created holes in it. So a very old surface there for Callisto. And that too is about the same size as the planet Mercury. Jupiter's got lots of other moons, uh, they keep finding more, I think they're up to 79 last time I checked. And then next door we've got the other really giant planet, Saturn, not quite as big as Jupiter. And uh, of course it has a family of moons, 
not shown there, quite a few of them. You can easily pick up some of those, even with binoculars. But of course, it has the rings. Binoculars will just about show you that the planet's not round. But a small telescope will show you the, the rings quite nicely and a medium size or larger will just improve the view. So here we go, this is a medium telescope and a large telescope and now we're zooming right in. You can see the fantastic structure of the cloud belts on the planet there and the uh, rings with the gap in them, the dark gaps, those are caused by interactions of the millions of particles that are, make up the rings all orbiting round with the gravity of some of the moons. Here's one of them, Titan. Again, this is a planet-sized moon. It's uh, about the same size as planet Mercury, covered in its own thick, smoggy atmosphere. That's about 50% more dense than the Earth's atmosphere and full of interesting organic compounds. And uh, they dropped a probe through that to find out what the uh, surface was like and found lakes of liquid methane and rivers of, of the same material. So a fascinating world in its own right. So we pull back away from Saturn now and over to the left hand side there you can see already another bright object just above the horizon, red in colour, and that's the planet Mars. So we'll zoom in on Mars, watch for its two little moons when they show up. So here's the disc, there's Phobos and Deimos, fear and terror, they are named because Mars is the god of war. And there's the uh, three quarter phase disc of Mars. It's, uh, the Earth's gradually closing in on Mars, catching up with it. We'll overtake it on the inside later this year. But if we zoom right in on this, we'll see the detail of the dark, dusty uh, regions and the red, rusty coloured areas. A little bit of a white polar cap there, just showing down towards the bottom of the screen where the day-night boundary on Mars is revealed. Mars is a fascinating world in its own right, as I could give a whole lecture on the subject of Mars and the history of it and uh, possibilities for life. So that was a whistle stop tour in 30 minutes of the things that you can look out for in the night sky of May 2020. And now we're just going to let time run forwards and the sun will soon come up from the east and the stars will fade away. So uh, I do hope you've enjoyed that. Do go out and have a look for some of these objects, either with binoculars or if you're lucky enough to have a telescope. And of course, you'll see lots of satellites flying around, particularly at the moment, the Starlink satellites. You can find out when those are available. There are various websites that will tell you when to look out for them. Um, and they really are interesting to see if you haven't seen them.